So I guess this is the place where you have, uh, should have arrived as you are going through physics 4b. At some point, you should have seen these four equations all together. And somebody should have told you, we call these Maxwell's equations. Um, now, if it, this doesn't sound familiar to you, that's fine. This is something I'm doing as an introductory material. On the first day, you will see that none of your homework questions are from this. And I'm not going to ask you anything on the exam about this either. So, um, but I want you to start from here because this is the fundamental basis for what we'll be spending a lot of time in, light. Oh, I have a cool demo that, well, I'm not sure if it's cool. I have a demo that now I can actually do. Um, so all of you are familiar with the light, right? Uh, can you see the laser beam? Yes, no? You can see the dots, but you don't see the beam, right? I got this uh, fog in a can to actually illustrate the beam. So It's non-toxic, that's why I'm spraying it towards you. <laughs> it's non-toxic. So with the fog in the that with the fog, now you can actually see the beam better, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the angle. Sometimes you can see, sometimes not. So this is the, when we talk about optics, this is how we are going to treat light a lot of the time. We are going to treat it like uh, something that's traveling in a straight path. Uh, we call it geometric optics, and we'll be spending something like a week and a half on it. And, um, sorry, the fog will eventually dissipate. And it doesn't smell like anything. Um, so, so, people have been dealing with the light way longer than we have actually understood what it is. And that's why I want to start from the, sort of the basic nature of light um, and sort of use that at least as a starting point. So, um, so these are the uh, Maxwell's equations that you hopefully saw in physics 4b. What, what subject does Maxwell's equations deal with? Uh, electromagnetic phenomena. Yeah, electricity and magnetism, right? Do everyone here remember what this letter E stands for? Yeah. What does it stand for? Jason? What does the letter E here stand for? It could be total. Total what? Oh, oh uh, let me zoom in. Can I zoom in? What does this E in, I guess it's in Gauss's law. It, you know, we often uh, visualize it that way. Uh, when you draw a picture for the thing that's represented as E, this is the graphical tool that you might have used to illustrate it. You do have uh, maybe a positive charge, and you do have some kind of lines going away from it. And sometimes it looks like a flow, the way it's drawn. And we talk about a flux of this. Actually, that's what this E dot DA is. That's maybe what you're remembering, the total flux of something. But what I'm asking is not the, the rest of this flux thing. I'm asking about what this E stands for, just the E. Kevin? Field. Electric field. So now, uh, you know, depending on when you took physics for me, um, you might feel like um, um, you don't quite remember everything. I would recommend that you do review. Um, I mean, as we progress through the semester, you will see better um, how much um, the stuff that we covered in previous class matters, how much it doesn't matter. Um, what we are going over today right now, um, it actually doesn't matter all that much for the rest of optics. So you know, if you don't remember that E stands for electric field, it's probably fine. I mean, you know, I wish you would remember, but it's probably not that bad. Anybody, what does B stand for? Magnetic has no B in it. M-A-G-N-E-T. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, P does stand for magnetic field. Who knows why it's V? <laughs> um, so, so Maxwell's equations, it's an equation that tells you how electric fields behave and magnetic fields behave. And um, I am actually better justified to write down what I am now going to write down than I was at the end of physics 4B, because everyone here should have taken math 3C, right? So if you have taken math 3C, then um, you may not understand where this is coming from, but you will at least know all the mathematical notations I'm using. What does this set of symbols stand for? Divergence. Divergence? Divergence? Yes? Everyone here are familiar with uh, divergence? Yes? Or what does this uh, symbol here stand for? What is the name for this? Gradient operator. Gradient operator, right? Yeah, you know, you covered all this in math 3C. By the way, here's a bit of a, if this is starting to freak you out, um, this class doesn't actually require math 3C all that much. Uh, multivariable stuff, actually physics 4B needs math 3C more than uh, physics 4 Physics 4B needs math 3C more than physics 4C needs math 3C. Don't ask me why. So, um, so, but hopefully, so when I write down these expressions, uh, you might not know what every st symbol stands for. Um, you might not know what any of this means, but at least you are familiar with the symbols. At least, uh, um, like, if uh, somebody asks you to sort of expand this out into an um, expression, so what is, what is uh, this particular um, operation called? Someone other than Gauger. Curl. Curl, yeah. So you have seen that in math 3C. So um, now that you have taken it, you know what curl means. So the reason I'm writing down, um, wait, yeah, yeah, mu naught j plus mu naught epsilon naught uh, time derivative of E. Um, and finally, curl of electric field is minus the time derivative of the magnetic field. So um, this is also Maxwell's equations. When you compare the formal, when you compare these equations that I just wrote down with the equations that you have seen, uh, depending on your instructor, in your past physics 4B class, you see there are some similarities, right? In fact, I tried to, oh wait, I swapped the order. Um, um, like you see one expression that deals with the electric field and this rho, uh, when you see rho in a physics class, what, so this is Greek letter rho. When you see Greek letter rho in a physics class, what does it typically stand for? Density. Yeah, density. So what this stands for is charge density. So in the other version of Maxwell's equations you have seen, you have seen electric field being related to charge. This is telling you how electric field relates to charge density. And they both have the same symbols, epsilon not here, epsilon not there, right? And um, I have an equation somehow dealing with the magnetic field. There's one dealing with the magnetic field, and both of them have zero on the right-hand side for some reason. Um, and uh, sorry, these two are swapped uh, as presented there. So this is the one that deals with the magnetic field. And so as you compare them, you s hopefully you see some similarities. I have this constant mu naught. Um, if you don't remember its name, it's fine. It's called the permeability or magnetic constant. I have mu naught here, mu naught there. I have, yeah, I prefer writing it in this order. Mu naught, epsilon naught, epsilon naught, mu naught, that's the same thing. Um, so 
as you, you know, if you take a five minutes, 10 minutes to stare at these equations, hopefully you get a vague sense that these are somehow related to these. They are not entirely separate, different. Anybody here know how these two are actually related to each other? Like, so if you wanted to, getting this from that is a lot harder, that's why I like this better. If you wanted to start from this set of expressions and end with the expression you see in your textbook, how would you do it? Use the calculus law. Okay, which calculus law? Yeah, you integrate. Yeah. So what you do is here, you do triple integral. You do a volume integral. Same here. And there's uh, some kind of theorem, Gauss's theorem. I think that's the name. I can never remember these names. Here, you do double integral, integral over some surface. Wait, is that right? Yeah, yeah you do yeah, integral over a surface that these are poking through. Yeah, you do double integral. And um, there's, is it called the Green's theorem or Stokes theorem? Uh, Green's theorem is the two dimensional version of Stokes theorem. Okay, so then it'll be Green's theorem then. Yeah, so you use Green's theorem to uh, reduce this down to a one dimensional line integral. When you have done that, this is what you get. And the right hand side is a simple, just simply doing the integral. So, uh, so they are both the Maxwell's equations. This is the differential form of Maxwell's equations. This is the integral form. Uh, when you took physics 4b, you have dealt with the integral, for, integral form for well, all of physics 4b because you know, most people haven't taken <laughs> multivariable calculus then. But I wanted to introduce this form because this is the form that's easier to use to explain where light comes from. So, I mean, as I started out with, people have studied, out, studied the light longer than they have understood it. Um, like Galileo, one of the things he was famous for was being the guy who used the telescope to do to, to a bunch of stuff. And all of that is dealing with the light. It's uh, dealing with the optics. A lot of things that we are gonna talk about in the next uh, week and a half, they have been known since Renaissance times, maybe even uh, longer ago. But we've only understood what light is in the, I guess last uh, century, century and a half, doesn't, century and a half? Yeah, only last century and a half. That's when we, we've only known what light actually is for only 150 years. Less than how long United States <laughs> have been around. So um, I want to show you mathematically that uh, what we call light, um, you can show that uh, this is a, what we call electromagnetic wave. It's a wave of electric fields and magnetic fields. And this is the way it's done. We get an equation called uh, a differential equation called wave equation. And um, so this is something that was supposed to be covered in physics 4A. And depending on who you had a teacher, it might not have been covered. <laughs> and um, even if it was covered, my experience is that most people forget. Because here's the thing. Um, I wish everyone have taken differential equations before you take your very first physics class except that's not practical. <laughs> so when you take your first physics class, you know what derivatives are, but you haven't really dealt with the differential equations. So, but this is the, uh, what should have been covered in physics 4A? Something called wave equation. It's a very particular form of equation. It's a differential equation. It, this might have been the context where for the first time, you saw something called the partial derivative. Everyone here is familiar with the partial derivative? Yeah. Once you knew what it was, it wasn't all that scary, right? It was actually simpler than regular derivative. So if you have a wave equation, let's say for a function of position and time, then the form of wave equation that you have seen in physics 4A would have looked like, you say, I take that function, take a double derivative with respect to position. Then 
this is going to equal to some constant times the double derivative of the function with respect to time. And this constant actually takes a very particular form. It's uh, written often as 1 over v squared, or 1 over c squared, depending on the person. Anybody remember, anybody remember why v? Like what's the significance of choosing the symbol v for this position? Or c for that matter. Like does this v have a particular physical meaning as a quantity? No one other than Gaudio remembers? <laughs> it's a velocity, yeah. This V is the wave velocity, or I don't know why I prefer wave speed. Because, because it's a scalar I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, this is the wave speed. So how many here, um, so if you didn't remember this equation offhand, that's fine, most people don't. How many here remember hearing about wave equation? Not a lot of you. <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, how many here, OK, I guess if, mm, how many here remember hearing about the phrase wave speed, either in connection with the wave equation or without the connection with the, like speed of a wave? You ever heard that? Um, uh, sorry, some people I don't remember. <laughs> sorry, Dimitri, I'm going to be picking on you because your name I remember. What can you tell me about wave speed? Do you know anything particular about wave speed that's somehow unique to waves? That's, uh, um, I mean, you know, speed is how fast something is moving across, right? You can talk about speed of this ball. But something was special about wave speed. You can relate it to frequency. You can relate it to frequency, OK. Because if you have a periodic wave, you have this relationship. If you have a periodic wave, then uh, let me try to remember this correct way. The wave speed is equal to frequency times, oops, times wavelength. That's what you are thinking of. I have a follow-up question. Let's say um, I have a wave. I can actually do that right now. I have a slinky here. I can make a, a wave using the slinky. Let me just weigh it down. Oh, that's not heavy enough. Um, here's Linky. I can make waves on it right now. I just shake one end, and there's the wave. Um, sorry, spring got stuck. Um, now, so if I shake this at a particular frequency, you see how fast the wave is traveling, right? Now, this is the follow-up question I want you to ask. If I change the frequency, how will my wave speed be affected? Let's say if I shake this at a slower frequency, how is my wave speed affected? Goes down. Goes down. A lot of people think of that. So let's actually do a quick try. So it's harder to see with a periodic wave. Let me do it with a pulse so that you can see how long it takes for the pulse to travel. So, so the way I guess I'll do it is I'll do a, either a very narrow pulse like this one or a very wide pulse like this one. That'll be like having a high frequency and uh, having a low frequency, right? And we can actually count how long it takes for the wave to travel from here to there. So let's just do that. Uh, this is the high frequency, 1,001, 1,002, maybe two seconds. This is the lower frequency, 1,001, 1,002, about the same amount of time, right? And uh, if I do this more periodically, you can actually see that too. Um, you can see that as if we you know, track it more uh, carefully, you can see that whether I shake it at this uh, regular frequency or I shake it at much lower frequency, now it does change how quickly this is moving back and forth. But what does not change is how quickly this uh, disturbance is moving across. So there's a phrase that I make many of my students memorize. So um, <laughs> let me see if some of you can come it other than Gaudia. Um, wave speed is fill in the blank. It, it's a phrase, yeah? Constant? Con uh, not always constant. I can actually change the wave speed here. But uh, changing the wave speed involves changing something else other than frequency. 
So the phrase I'm thinking of is wave speed is, uh, depending on how you phrase it, either three or four words. Could be five, depending on how many A's and does you use. If you don't use any O's or does, three words. So wave speed doesn't depend on the frequency or wavelength. What does it depend on? The medium. Yeah. So here, if I wanted to change wave uh, uh, speed, this is what I'll do. I'll change the medium itself. I'm going to stretch it out. What that does is it makes it less dense and it increases tension. Both of them have an effect of increasing the wave speed. So you'll see when I do the pulse, 1,001, 1,000. Two. Thousand, one thousand. Yeah, I, it's like, a, it's not full two seconds, it's the 1.5 seconds. And if I do even less of that, then, oh, sorry, it's not staying. Thousand, one thousand, you can see the change. So to change wave speed, uh, you have to change the medium itself. So the phrase I, I would recommend that you memorize is, wave speed is a property of medium. And this is how it's mathematically represented. So you know, if I was, if I was teaching, oh, I mean, I do teach physics 10, and when I teach physics 10, that's where I end with. Wave speed is property of medium. That's the fact I want you to memorize, and you're good. But because you guys have mathematical background, you can see now what it means for wave speed to be property of medium. This uh, wave equation, this is determined by whatever the physical arrangement of the medium is. And that out of that arrangement, you get this particular constant here. And once you have this constant, then your wave speed is determined. This is how the medium determines the wave speed. And, um, I think if you took physics 4A with me, at some point as we were covering waves, I should have told you guys that the most important thing we cover in physics 4A is waves. That's the single topic you will see in all three physics classes, physics 4A, 4B, 4C. You should have seen what I'm going to show you now in physics 4B, but I know a lot of instructors skip it. Sometimes I skip it too. <laughs> so, um, so, so the description here is a general because it applies to so many things. And uh, I want, to, want you to especially emphasize this because this general nature of wave will become more important, even more important in this semester. When we do quantum mechanics, um, another word for quantum mechanics is wave mechanics. It's one of the formulations of quantum mechanics. And um, the kind of wave that's making up the waves in quantum mechanics, it's not any kind of wave you can even visualize because we don't have a proper image for that. Chemists to try, but, and they do a good, good job, but it's a more of a diagram than actual reality of the nature. So, um, so what I want to show is that, that sort of a more abstract mathematical approach of something we could say in a simple phrase. Wave speed is property of medium. If you simply say that, that will be correct. There's nothing wrong with saying wave speed is property of medium. That's right. <laughs> and, but what we can do more is we can actually show mathematically how is it a property of medium. And um, the electric field and magnetic field is one particular kind of medium where after a few somewhat abstract mathematical steps, we can get an equation that looks kind of like this. We can get a wave equation. And once we do that, we'll see a constant that fits into this space. And once we see that constant, then we, we will be able to see what was, what is the speed of electromagnetic wave. So uh, it's been a, about a month since I last did this, so I don't know how long it'll take. I'll try to go through uh, quickly without leaving too many people behind. Um, so I have to make some simplifications because all these are nas not nasty, um, sophisticated multivariable calculus expression. And do you guys remember triple product? Method 3C covers triple product, right? Doesn't? 
you know what, that might be actually upper division content. Never mind. Um, I, I, all I was going to say is I, I didn't want to do triple product. And since it so, doesn't sound like any of you know what triple product is, that's good. Because I don't remember the formulas for triple product anyway. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to simplify these expressions so that eventually I am only dealing with a one dimensional um, a function. So you know, when I have these functions, in general, this is true. The electric field, in general, it's a function of a three-dimensional space, right? Because it can be, I can define an electric field at any point in space. And you need a three space coordinates to specify a point here, right? So it's electric field in general is a function of position or x, y, and z. And in this particular case, apparently we are interested in electric field that's changing as a function of time. So this is also a function of time. So we are dealing with something that's changing a lot in a lot of uh, different ways. Um, so I just want to make this uh, simple for myself. So I'm going to introduce uh, a couple, two simplifications. This is actually more simplifications than what I did in physics 4B, but I just want to make it go a little bit faster. So let me uh, first define my coordinate system so that we have some common reference point. Let's say this is my x direction. Uh, let me define it this way. This is going to be my y direction. Then what direction should g come out in? Out of the board, right? Right hand rule. Now, if you didn't remember that, uh, that's another thing you don't really have to worry about in this class. The whole right hand rule stuff, um, it was more for physics 4B. In physics 4C, we don't really do multivariable stuff. So if you didn't remember it, not that big of a deal, although you should probably review it at some point. Um, so this is our coordinate system. This is our right-handed coordinate system. And let, uh, this is what I'm going to say. As I imagine changing the electric field, I'm just going to say I'm really only interested in electric field, uh, some kind of a prop disturbance that's moving in the x direction. So I'm going to. Uh, make a choice that however I'm making, generating my electric field, as I go to different points along y or go to different points along z, my electric field is not going to change. Yeah. So I'm just going to limit myself to uh, having my electric field only be a function of x and t. Yeah. It's just a choice I'm making. And uh, later on, later on, at some point, I don't know if it'll be in this class, uh, this uh, amounts to saying that the waves that we are dealing with are plane waves. Because, you know, waves in general are complicated looking. They can be spherical waves. They can be going out in all directions. But here I'm going to say the way my wave looks is along a plane, it looks very boring. Nothing's changing. And as the wave moves, it looks like it's this plane is moving across. So, so I'm making this assumption that the wave I'm dealing with is plane wave. So using this assumption, let's try to simplify these expressions. Um, everyone has rough sense of what this divergence is, right? Yes, divergence. Um, should I write it out? You know what? I should write it out. I think uh, it's. Uh, once again, I don't want to lose too many people. Um, and it's already complicated enough. So um, let me use red. I think that's the color I haven't used. So let me just write out this expression, just uh, spelling out what divergence is. So spelling out what divergence is, it's uh, um, it's a dot product that product between the gradient to vector operator and the electric field vector. So when you take the dot product, the, remember the component definition of the dot product, you get, well, derivative with respect to x, um, product with the x component of electric field. It's not really a product, but kind of looks like a product, so I'm going to pretend it's a product. <laughs> We call it abusing the notation in physics. Uh, maybe in math, too. 
So this is the divergence spelled out. The, you are taking the x component derivative with respect to x, y component derivative with respect to y, z com oops, supposed to be z component derivative with respect to z. Um, and uh, so for this electromagnetic wave, uh, so this is the simplification one that I have made. Um, we say it's not going to be, a, it's only going to be a function of x. And let me tell you the second simplification we are going to make. Um, when you see this, so I mean, I hope all of you are getting the hint earlier. It's this light that's going to be electromagnetic wave. As the light moves across, is there any electric charge between where my laser pointer is and where my hand is? Is there any electric charge? I mean, not, it could be vacuum and the light would still go through, right? Light goes through space, the vacuum of space. So when we are describing this wave, we, are, we should be able to come up with an equation in a region of space where it's a vacuum. In other words, I'm going to talk about region of space where charge density is equal to zero. So the right hand side, instead of being this, it's going to be zero because we are dealing with uh, points in space that are in vacuum, no matter anywhere, so no charge density. So we do this, so, um, so that's the second simplification. So we do these two simplifications, the Gauss's law equation, it becomes this. Um, so this is zero because electric field doesn't depend on y. This is zero because electric field doesn't depend on z. And wait, did I do something wrong? Hmm. Well, I guess I should have still write it down. <laughs> um, x derivative of x component of electric field, that's also zero. Hmm. Wait, is that right? I guess it must be right. Yeah, yeah, so I think what this is saying is that we don't have x component of electric field, right? So, yeah, so, um, well, okay, so that's, uh, at least the derivative is zero. So what that means is um, if there's any x component of electric field, it'll be a constant field which we don't really care about. Um, I think that's right. So if we have any interesting electric field along this x-axis, it's got to point either in the y direction or it has to point in the z direction. Right? Because all we have said was that the, these components with respect to, the, uh, with respect to the, the variables that they are not supposed to depend on are zero. But what we haven't said yet is the derivative of y with respect to x, that may not be zero. And derivative of z component with respect to x also may not be zero. This is not, hasn't been set yet by the equations we have written now. Good? Okay. Um, let's see, what am I trying to do? Oh, right. I'm, um, so I think that's uh, some uh, set of things that I needed to do <laughs> um, to actually work through the interesting expression. So, um, so this is, um, or rather, how do I put it? So these are the actual interesting expressions I want to look at. Um, let me first write down the simplified version in vacuum. So in vacuum, this is how they look. Once again, in vacuum, this is the simplification number two that we made earlier. The current is going to be zero. Um, I guess electric field and magnetic field still don't have to be zero in vacuum. So in vacuum, these are going to look like curl of magnetic field is equal to uh, mu naught epsilon naught time derivative of electric field and curl of electric field is equal to minus 
the time derivative of the magnetic field. Um, if you're trying to remember where this came from when you took physics 4b, uh, this expression came from Ampere's law. In particular, it came from the very last piece you covered in physics 4b. It came from a portion of Ampere's law that's called the Maxwell term. It's a, a Maxwell's term or a Maxwell term. This last term is what Maxwell figured out must be there. And that is the reason we call this equation Maxwell equation. And this one, is actually, this one came a little bit earlier in the semester. This comes directly from Faraday's law. This is just the, uh, the, in, the differential form of Faraday's law that you should have seen in integral version. Um, so this is the simplified version of these equations where we are saying current is zero because you are in vacuum. And what my goal is, is I want to get to this expression here, something that looks like a wave equation. And this is my starting point. And the longer I stay, stare at it, this expression can never really become that. Like, um, why am I saying that? Like, what am I looking at and saying, no matter whatever I do with this, just the, with this alone, I cannot get to that. Something is definitely missing that no amount of, you know, writing out the components will do. What am I missing? I mean, so you are not going to see V here because I'm first going to get a um, combination of uh, constants that I'm going to call wave speed later. So the letter for constant doesn't matter. Gaja, what were you saying about second? The second order derivative. Second order derivative. Here, you see second order time derivative, second order position derivative. Here, I only see first order derivative of time. And does everyone recognize this as the first order position derivative? Yes, that's what gradient operator does. Um, yeah, so I don't have enough order of derivatives. I need a second order, not first order. So what I'm going to do to get second order derivative is um, I'm going to stare at this thing for a while. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression, take the whole thing, and I'm going to take the curl of the entire expression. I can do that, right? I can you know, take whatever equation is, take curl of left-hand side, take the curl of right-hand side. They'll still be equal to each other. So after I've done that, it becomes, the left-hand side becomes something complicated. That's why I wanted this, so that I can simplify term by term later. Curl of curl of electric field, I have to be careful, this is the order that you want to do that in, is equal to, um, is everyone okay with the curl and the time derivative swapping order? That, that's a valid mathematical operation? Think, yeah, think back to your multivariable calculus. If you have a partial derivative with respect to x and then partial derivative with respect to y, can you swap that order? Yeah, under some reasonable assumptions, right? In physics, we almost always assume anything that's reasonable is true. Um, mathematicians sometimes don't. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to swap that order and I'm going to write it this way. Minus the time derivative and then the, now the curl is inside the time derivative. So I have curl of magnetic field. When you look at the left-hand side, I mean, it's complicated. But you can kind of see we are closer to what we wanted. We have a first order position derivative. We have another position derivative. So somehow out of this, we are going to get second order position derivative. Right? But when you look at the right hand side, we don't quite have that. We have 
position derivative and then time derivative. What's worse, uh, this is magnetic field, this is electric field, and it's supposed to be the same thing. It's both F on the right and the left hand side. But there's something on the board that helps you simplify this one more step so that it starts to look more similar to the wave equation. Have you? Yeah, I have something I can just directly plug into here. So let me do that. Um, so let me do that and write down the simplified version in black here. So when I combine these two, then the left hand side, I'm just going to leave it as it is. It's a bit of a complicated expression that I'll deal with later, soon but later. Double curl of electric field is equal to minus. Uh, I'm going to pull out these two constants since, no, yeah. Mu naught, epsilon naught. Let's see, I have this time derivative, and I'm going to have this time derivative, so I'm going to have double time derivative of electric field. It's a, this is now beginning to look much more closer to the form of wave equation. And actually, you know what, in the interest of time, let me skip the rest of the math. I will just tell you that if you wanted to work this out for yourself, it takes a long time, that's why I'm gonna skip it. Um, um, let me just tell you what the answer will be. Um, this left-hand side, this will simplify down to so that it looks like minus double position derivative double x derivative, not just any position but x, because position derivative with respect to y and z equal to zero. And um, this electric field, um, it'll be, at some point you have to make another simplifying assumption. Either assume it's pointing in y direction or pointing in z direction, but not x. So this will become your left hand side, then you know minus cancels, then minus, and you get something that will look like wave equation. So this is the step that I'm going to be skipping, but um, even here, you can begin to see the similarity, right? Yes? Yeah. So at this step, if we had to guess what combination of co coefficients, co combination of constants will fit as this wave speed of V here, then what would you say that is? Just staring, comparing at, um, staring at these two expressions. Comparing expression one with expression two. So you make some connections. Um, so what used to be a general function f here, that's going to be related to the function that actually represents electric field, right? Things like a time variable, position variable, they just match one to one. So if we want to say the V here is equal to some combination of quantities here, what would you say that is? All right, um, I want to be careful. I don't think you mean that V is equal to mu naught epsilon naught. You don't mean that, right? Okay, so let's be, tell me what it is. Uh, um, tell me the two quantities, two exact combination of quantities that are actually equal to each other. I mean, you don't have to do the algebra in your head. Just tell me the two quantities that are actually equal to each other. Kevin. <laughs> okay, but you are somehow wanting to associate V with mu naught and epsilon naught, right? Because they are both constants. And so th this is the intuition I want to nurture, that this particular block, based on where it is, is actually equal to this particular block. Right? Once you see then, then the very first thing you should do, this is actually common in any physics problem solving. Once you see relationship between two things, don't focus on solving it to the very final answer. 
the very, uh, what you want to focus on instead is writing down uh, the relationship. Here, the relationship you want to write down is that this combination of quantities, mu naught, epsilon naught, is equal to this particular expression involving v. So I would say this is equal to 1 over v squared. Because when you, want, when you try to jump to the final answer right away, most people you know, don't make that big jump in one single bound. You have to first to start off with this. And then once you have this, then the rest is actually EG algebra. You just solve this for v. What is v? OK, there's the square root. Over one, or yeah. one over the square root. Yeah, take the reciprocal and then square root, right? So, or like square root of 1 over mu naught, epsilon naught. So we've skipped quite a few steps, but this is the result. So Maxwell was the guy, actually, who went through these calculations first. Because Maxwell was the guy who came up with this term that actually made this calculation possible. So when he, he's a, he was, he's a theoretician. So when he went through this theoretical calculation, this is the expression, this is the expression he came to, suggesting the possibility of some kind of a wave. And what event, and the speed of that wave would be determined by this. And at Maxwell's time, these were known constants. This is something called the permittivity of free space or um, or the, uh, I guess, electric constant, as we call these days. This is the permeability of free space, or magnetic constant. They are both independently known from electric experiments and magnetic experiments. Let me, I think this textbook actually has their values in SI unit. So let me write them down so that I can actually do the calculation. Um, wait, does it not have? That kind of book doesn't have the constants in the front and back. Mm, maybe I'm not recommending good book to you. I'm just kidding. It, one thing I will tell you is that this book is not edited the way I hope it was. <laughs> I have volume two. Volume two is the electromagnetic textbook. It's better have the actual constants in there somewhere. Uh, I mean, failing that, I'm just going to look it up on Wolfram Alpha. All right, all from alpha it is. All right, so uh, I think Upsilon, uh, Epsilon, I think all from alpha will actually understand what I mean by Epsilon naught. Uh, they mean, yeah, electric constant. Um, let me use, OK, here it is. This is the basic SI unit. Uh, <laughs> so epsilon naught is approximately 9 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Um, it's OK if you don't remember what farads and meters are. What's important is that both the farad, unit of capacitance, and meter are the basic SI unit. It's not microfarad and it's not kilometer. Um, the promise of SI unit is that as long as you stick to basic SI unit, you will end up with a basic SI unit in the end. So, okay, so that's the electric constant. Uh, let me look up mu naught. I have a feeling Wolfram Alpha will actually understand what I mean by mu naught when I just say mu naught. Um, Magnetic constant, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> um, Henry per meter, that sounds like SI unit. So the magnetic constant mu naught is equal to 1.2, let me just do 1.3. 1.3 times 10 to minus 6 Henry per meter. Henry is unit of inductance. If you didn't remember that, once again, it's fine. As long as you recognize it as a, it's not merely Henry. It's basic SI unit. So you know, I have these numbers, basic SI units that I can plug in. And the working out the unit, unless we go into what Farad and Henry are, it's going to get complicated. What I'm just going to trust is that because I'm using SI unit, I'm just going to trust that my unit will come out to be meters per second. 
the basic SI unit of speed of V. Yeah. If you don't trust, you can check it on your own time later. Um, so it, what I'm calculating is the square root of 1 over 9 times 10 to minus 12 times 1.3 times 10 to minus 6. And after you work out all the units, it's going to become meters per second. Uh, I think I can actually do this kind of in my head. 9 times 1.3, it's going to be close enough to 10. I mean, you know, 12, close enough to 10. Um, so it's going to be 10 times 10 to minus 12 times 10 to minus, so 10 to minus 18. So 1 over 10 to minus 17, right? Yes. So it's a square root of 1 over 10 to minus 17 meter per second. Um, let me rewrite this in a slight way that I will explain later. I'm going to write 10, multiply top and bottom by 10. Then it's 10 over 10 to minus 16, right? Uh, what's the square root of 10, approximately? Three, yeah, three is close enough. So this is going to be equal to approximately three times, um, so one over 10 to minus 16 is 10 to the 16, right? What's the square root of 10 to the 16? Yeah, 10 to the eight. 10 to the eight meters per second. So this was the theoretically derived speed of electromagnetic wave. Do you know anything that moves that fast? So in Maxwell's time, there was really only one thing that physicists knew moved that fast, uh, light. People have actually made measurement of speed of light before Maxwell did all this calculation. Your textbook actually described all those ingenious um, experimental arrangements that allow the people to measure the speed of light. It's under the section, the propagation of light. And um, if you uh, read it through it, you will read about, uh, oops, uh, if you read it through it, you will read about how people actually made a measurement. So or one of the earliest measurement was based on astronomy. Um, itself is kind of amazing that people were able to figure that out. And later on, people actually made mechanical setups where they could uh, uh, directly measure the speed of light. So, so by Maxwell's time, people knew that this is how fast, uh, this is how fast light traveled at three, about 300 million meters per second. You know, 300 times 10 to the six meters per second. And so when Maxwell came to this result, it made it easier for him to conclude that this electromagnetic wave that he's theoretically hypothesizing might be the light wave that people have been trying to figure out for a long time. And, um, and so he made a guess. And if you read the book, there's an experiment by Hertz who actually verified experimentally that, yes, you can produce, um, I guess it's not. Or, or I guess experimentally verified that electromagnetic waves travel at speed of light. I don't know. Uh, read the book. <laughs> These are the details I actually get confused on. Um, so this is the sort of the underlying nature of light. And I want you to start the semester with this material because you're actually going to see light a lot. You're going to see light in the context of optics. I mean, that's what light is. But we are somehow going to ignore all this for a while. We are going to do geometric optics for a while. But that's why I want you to start out with this, even though we are going to step away this for a while. And then later, when we come back to quantum mechanics, talk about photoelectric effect, um, I want you to remember this, that people had figured out light as early as 1860s. People have proven mathematically that light is electromagnetic wave. And then later on, we're going to talk about how light is not a wave. <laughs> so um, that's all coming down the semester. And for the next uh, four or five weeks or so, it's going to be very practical optics. This is the kind of thing you deal with um, 
if you are like if you are on um, if you become an optometrician, <laughs> you'll be dealing with the stuff we are going to cover in the next few weeks.